This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Wemmick. Welcome back to our increasingly perplexing and poorly thought out Halloween series of monsters that begin with the letter W. And we're getting really obscure this week. We're talking about a beast that most modern gamers have never even heard of. This particular beastie, it's the Wemmick by the way, was last mentioned in any version of our favorite game more than 15 years ago. Heck, as far as we can tell, it hasn't been mentioned in any major published game product, or even video game, for at least 10 years. And that last mention was in something called the Maelstrom live-action role-playing game, which, according to the internet, only British people know about. And that's only fitting, even if its mythological origins have pretty much been forgotten. But it is a part of a strangely endearing mythological tradition. Obviously, we'll get to all that. But first, you might be wondering why we're talking about a creature that has been so thoroughly forgotten by the gaming community. There's two reasons to bring up the Wemmick now. First, we're old enough to remember seeing the Wemmick in print. Specifically, we saw it pop up in the reprinted Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition Monster Manual. And they stuck in the back of our heads because they seemed pretty cool. And now, given that we've taken on the part-time unpaid job of tracking down the origins of such monsters, we're going to satisfy our personal curiosity. Which is, by the way, why the Wyvern got an episode. The second reason is because our calendar is based on a solar year and a lunar month, and those things don't quite line up. Months, as you probably know, are based on the lunar cycle. That is, they are based on how long it takes the moon to go through its full complement of phases and get back to where it started. At least, if we're talking about a synodic month. Which is where the whole month thing started. Even though it's technically inaccurate. And the length of a synodic month can vary by up to seven hours depending on the time of year. What are we talking about? Well, let's start simple. Lunar phases. If you've ever looked up at the night sky, you might notice a big pale sphere floating in the sky with a spooky face on it. That's called the moon. Now the moon is made of rock. Technically, it's made of earth rock. The moon was, according to the most popular theory, knocked off the planet billions of years ago when a planet-sized space rock smashed into the earth. And if you've ever looked at an earth rock, you might notice that they don't actually glow. These surprising revelations are exactly the sorts of things that keep you downloading this podcast week after week, aren't they? The moon glows because it reflects the light of the sun. But only half the moon is facing the sun at any given time. Now, the moon is locked in orbit around the Earth. And as the moon orbits the Earth, the part we can see from where we are includes different portions of the illuminated and non-illuminated halves of the moon. When the moon is on one side of us and the sun is on the other, we can see the whole face of the moon illuminated. That's a full moon. When the moon and the sun are on the same side of us, we are facing the back side of the moon, so we can't see it at all. That's the new moon. And when the moon is somewhere in between those positions, we can see half the face, or a quarter of it, or a whole bunch, or just a sliver. Now, archaeological evidence suggests that as far back as the Paleolithic era, people had noticed that the moon seemed to change shape in the sky. Regularly. And they kept count of that. And that was the origin of the idea of a month. Now, the moon takes approximately 27 days and 8 hours to orbit completely around the Earth. That's called a sidereal month. The length of time it takes the moon to travel completely around the Earth. But a synodic month, the one that we have been keeping track of since the Stone Age, is actually closer to 29 days and 12 hours. And it can vary by several hours. Why? Because the Earth is moving around the Sun while the Moon is moving around the Earth. And since the phase of the moon is based on the relative positions of the sun, the moon, and the earth, 
the moon has to move a little farther in its orbit to get back to the same relative position to be in the same phase to account for the changes in the Earth's position. Now, all of that is complicated by the fact that it takes the Earth 365 days and 4 hours to get completely around the Sun. And that motion creates seasonal weather patterns. And that's why we measure years by passage around the Sun. And since there's no good way to divide 365 days and a bit by 29 days and a bit, we end up with a calendar whose months are a little wonky. Some are 30 days. Some are 31. One is 28. Sometimes we need to add a day. Sometimes we even need to skip adding a day. It's a mess. The upshot is that every month, bar one, consists of four weeks and a few extra days. And that means when your podcast releases on, say, a Tuesday, every so often you're going to end up with an extra Tuesday in a month. Normally, that's not a problem. But if you planned your theme around finding four interesting monsters all starting with a particularly rare letter of the alphabet without looking at the calendar, you could end up one W short. And then you have to dig through older and older monster manuals to find something to talk about. Which brings us to the Wemmick. The Wemmick first appeared in the first edition of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons in a little supplement known as Monster Cards. These were basically packs of cards with monster statistics on them. The Wemmick was later incorporated into the hardback book of monster statistics called Monster Manual 2. That was in 1983. In 1989, they were republished in a collection of monsters for the Forgotten Realms under the second edition of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, and were then incorporated into the revised monster manual for that edition in 1993. They appeared in a few other minor supplements after that. Then, they were updated to the third edition of Dungeons & Dragons in the Monsters of Faerun supplement, and even briefly became a playable character race in Races of Faerun. That was 2003. And then, they were forgotten forever. The Wemmick is described, first and foremost, as a leonine counterpart to the centaur. It is basically a humanoid torso and arms and head, crammed onto the neck of a four-legged lion's body. Wemmicks are powerful warriors and hunters of average intelligence. They possess technology roughly equivalent to Neolithic humans, including fire, pottery, and the ability to make stone tools and weapons and their society is similar to that of Stone Age hunter-gatherers with decidedly leonine influences. They live in tribal family groups called prides. Their women bear up to three cubs at a time, and they are quite territorial. And they came seemingly out of nowhere. They had no known precedent in the game. Wemex seem to have no mythological origins. They actually do, but we'll get back to that. They just appeared on a stat card one day as a bonus monster. It wasn't until recently that a more intrepid gaming historian did some legwork to figure out where the thing had come from. He started by contacting the artist who had drawn the creature on the card, Jim Rosloff. Rosloff, who had been the art director at TSR at the time, said that he wasn't sure who had invented the creature, but that he was sure it was either Tom Moldvay or David Zeb Cook. Both of those names should be familiar to anyone with any memory of the old days of D&D. And it was Cook who put the amateur sleuth onto David C. Sullivan III. That's another famous name from the early days of D&D. He was an artist and did a lot of famous illustrations for the first edition, including his most famous depiction of a knight surrounded by devils called a paladin in hell. That piece was anecdotally part of the inspiration for the original Doom PC game. Fortunately, all of this sleuthing actually happened in January of 2005, so the sleuth was able to talk to Sutherland before he passed away in the summer of that year. Sutherland admitted he'd invented the creature basically out of whole cloth, and he'd invented it as a, quote, Zulu version of a centaur, part human, part lion, end quote. We should note 
that we're incredibly grateful to the amateur sleuth who hunted down this information 12 years ago and maintained a fan site about Wemix in D&D under the name of Kazel for nearly 10 years before the site stopped updating. If you're out there, Kazel, thanks. Now, that phrase, a Zulu version of a centaur, tells us more or less how the germ for the Wemmick got planted in David Sutherland's mind. And it's nothing to do with mythology. Or even history. It probably happened around 1964, in a movie theater. When David Sutherland would have been in his teenage years, because that was the year in which the film Zulu was first released in the United Kingdom and then released in America. Zulu was a significant film and enjoyed a substantial amount of critical and commercial success. It is one of the most famous and enduring of British films, and it has influenced countless filmmakers and creators. Its visuals, especially its huge battle scenes, were stunning for the time and earned it many accolades. Peter Jackson is said to have purposely emulated the film's battles in his Lord of the Rings trilogy. And so, it became a part of the cultural consciousness in that era. And it's no surprise that it might have influenced Dungeons and Dragons. Certainly the image of the powerful aboriginal warriors, the Zulus, against the backdrop of the African plains would pretty much lead a creative artist to the Wemmick. But Zulu wasn't just a film. It was a dramatization of a battle that, under any other circumstances, would have been a heroic triumph. A tiny garrison of 140 sick and injured soldiers held out for 12 hours to repel the repeated assaults of 3,000 powerful warriors and ultimately managed to rout and then disperse the enemy army. And to be fair to the soldiers in that battle, they did stand valiantly and do their duty. But behind that battle lies the story of one man who deceived his own government, ignored his orders, and instigated a war that cost thousands of lives, not to mention that it would lead to an even more brutal conflict years later. Incidentally, this war, the Anglo-Zulu War, was the last preemptive war to be launched by the British government in history. The story of the Anglo-Zulu War begins in eastern Central Africa with a collection of tribes known as the Bantu. Among the Bantu tribes were a tribe of herders known as the Nguni. 3,000 years ago, these people entered the Iron Age and enjoyed a period of peace and plenty. A population explosion led various tribes, including the Nguni, into exodus. Over the course of the next thousand years, the Nguni expanded south and east, dispersing across the land and driving out the local tribes known as Bushmen, and continuing their lifestyle of hunting, gathering, and herding. They divided into patriarchal clans based on family lines, and the clans unified into political alliances known as chiefdoms. Political power was maintained through strength and military might, and because few clans had sufficient might to guarantee loyalty among Vassal clans, chiefdoms were short-lived and political power shifted constantly. New clans were constantly appearing during this time. When the head of a clan would die, his sons, often born by two or three different wives, would take wives and create their own clans. And it was during this time that Zulu was born. Following his father's death, Zulu used some of his inherited livestock as dowries and took several wives. He led his wives and followers south to a lush, fertile basin along the Makumbane River to establish a village. He named the land KwaZulu, which, because his name meant heaven, translated to Place of the Heavens and Zulu quickly grew prosperous, growing both his herd and his family. The Zulu clan might have remained just another small but prosperous clan in the history of Africa, if not for the strategic importance of their valley in the rivalry between two rival chieftains. In the late 1700s, the Dingus Weo chieftain brokered an alliance with the Zulu clan. The Zulu leader enjoyed a great deal of autonomy under the alliance, and the Dingus Weo gained a buffer state. If their rivals, the Nindondwe, wanted to bring their might against the Dingus Whale, they'd have to squeeze through the Zulu's valley. Now, the Zulu were not terribly mighty at the time, 
But in 1787, a young man named Shaka Zulu was born to the clan's current leader. Unfortunately, he was born out of wedlock and could not inherit the clan. His younger brother was the rightful heir. But Shaka proved himself to be a skilled and capable warrior and impressed the Dingus way of chieftain. He was ruthlessly cunning. After his father's death, Shaka arranged the murder of his younger brother. Dingus Weo then sent him a substantial military force to seize control of the Zulu clan. Shaka himself proved a capable leader, a skilled tactician, and a loyal patron. Until Dingus Weo's armies were overrun by enemies and the chieftain was killed. After the death of the Dingus Weo chieftain, the Nidwandwe turned their attention on the Zulu. The Zulu managed to repulse onslaught after onslaught, but there was no end to the attacks in sight. Shaka knew he had to take the offensive. Shaka had already proved his tactical acumen on the defensive, but to go on the offensive, he knew he had to innovate. He developed a horn-shaped attack formation, and to maximize the formation's effectiveness, he dispensed with the full-body shields and long throwing spears that had been the Bantu warrior's traditional weapons for centuries. Instead, he favored smaller shields, shorter thrusting spears, and a variety of other hand weapons. His army routed the Nduandwe, conquering their lands and dispersing their armies. And then he continued to push outward, soon conquering a vast empire that earned him the nickname from various historians of the time, the Black Napoleon. Shaka conquered a massive kingdom before his death, but the kingdom was never truly secure, and it only grew more fractured and divided as time went on. That sets the stage of the Anglo-Zulu War. By the 1870s, the British Empire had established numerous colonies in South Africa. It also had alliances with several native communities and occupied several more. The whole of South Africa was a loosely held hodgepodge. And the English government under Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli and Queen Victoria dispatched a man named Sir Barrel Freer to Cape Town to begin consolidating their holdings into some sort of united confederacy. Unfortunately for Freer, there was a military empire just to the north with some 40,000 disciplined warriors. The Zulu. Freer didn't think such a unification would be possible with the Zulu just to the north. Now, the British had already secured a loose alliance with the Zulu and had the support of the Zulu king, Quechueo. But Quechueo was not seen as a particularly strong ruler, and many Zulu felt he was a puppet of the British crown. Plague and famine were also ravaging the Zulu people at the time. The result was that the Zulu were a lawless mess. But Freer only saw the 40,000-strong army. He wrote to his superiors in the British government, but they instructed him firmly not to take action against the Zulu. The British Empire did not want a war. The Empire had grown war-weary and was facing a conflict with Russians in Eastern Europe. So Freer took matters into his own hands. He issued an insulting ultimatum to the Zulu king, demanding ridiculous taxes and that the Zulu disband their army. Quechueo refused, and Freer without the approval of the British crown, went to war. On January 11, 1879, 5,000 British soldiers invaded the Zulu kingdom. They were led by an ambitious and overconfident officer, Lord Chelmsford, who felt that the Zulu's primitive weapons and tactics would be no match for the superior British army, despite their vast numerical advantage. At Isandawana, the British soldiers met 20,000 Zulu warriors. The Zulu suffered heavy casualties, but the British soldiers were utterly decimated. Of the original 5,000 and another 750 reinforcements, less than 1,300 survived. The Battle of Rourke's Drift, the battle immortalized in Cy Young's 1964 film Zulu, followed just a few days after the disastrous engagement at Sandalwana. That was the battle in which less than 200 British soldiers managed to hold the British position and repel the Zulu counter-invasion. Really, the Zulu were merely pursuing the British invaders back to their encampment. And, in all likelihood, the defense of Rourke's drift really didn't matter a great deal. 
The resulting Anglo-Zulu War was a protracted, bloody conflict that would last about six months and require nearly 25,000 British soldiers. In August of 1879, King Quechua was captured and the Zulu Empire collapsed, much of it being annexed by the British Empire itself. So why did the Battle of Rourke's Drift remain so prominent? Well, that was entirely Lord Chelmsford's doing. See, Chelmsford's overconfidence had led him to make a lot of mistakes, and he knew it. He had acted without scouting properly, he had blundered into an ambush, and he made several other foolish strategic mistakes that ultimately led to the disaster to Sandalwana. So Chelmsford buried whatever evidence he could of his terrible decisions. And he passed the blame, wherever he could, to another officer named Colonel Durnford, who had not survived. But even that wasn't enough to assuage Chelmsford's superiors. Back in London, when people heard about the disaster to Sandalwana, they were stunned that the great British army could be defeated by what they thought of as a bunch of primitive savages. People were calling for Chelmsford to be stripped of command. So Chelmsford used the heroic story of the defense of Rourke's drift for his own gain. And he offered commendations to several officers who had been part of the defense. Popular officers. Despite that, Chelmsford was eventually recalled from South Africa. And when he was called before Queen Victoria, he repeated his lies and again emphasized the heroic defense of Rourke's drift. Although he never commanded again, Queen Victoria honored him with a promotion, a cushy government position, and a royal commendation. And Rourke's drift was immortalized. And the irony of all this? Well, the story of the Battle of Rourke's Drift, for many years, overshadowed the disastrous battle that preceded it and the brutal and ultimately unsanctioned war that followed. And the creature that some artist at TSR invented after probably seeing the film account of that battle overshadows the very old story of the Wemmick from ancient Assyria. You see, the Assyrians had a thing for hybrid monsters in their myths and culture. From the Lamassu, a winged bull with the head of a king, to the shape-changing Assyrian pantheon birthed from Tiamat, the Assyrians were heavily invested in strange hybrid creatures. In fact, they even had a protector spirit that would watch over you while you were bathing. Its name was Ermalulu, and it had the head and torso of a human on the body of a lion. And they put it everywhere you could conceivably wash up, including their pitchers and urns, so it could watch you wherever and whenever you might be washing yourself. Try not to think about that the next time you're in the shower. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gmwordoftheweek. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. <laughs>